Well, good morning, Community Church. It's great to see you and be with you today. We are continuing in our Church on the Move series. So over the course of the summer, we're looking at a few of the highlights of the book of Acts. We've covered a good amount of territory so far. We're continuing on in Acts chapter 9 today. So if you have a Bible, I invite you to open that up and turn with me to Acts chapter 9. That's where we're going to be camping out today. And as you are turning there, today we're going to look at really just an amazing story. In fact, as I was coming up with this message, I was just struck at like how how much is in here. And so we're going to do things just a little bit differently. I just want to go through this and kind of highlight some things on the way, because there is just so much in this chapter uh, that is is just so good. So we're going to do that. Um, And as you are are turning there, um, we're going to read today about Saul's conversion. So if you know anything about Saul or Paul, uh, in fact, actually, one of the questions that I've gotten a lot over the years is, why... Why did he have his name changed? Or who, like, who exactly is Saul and Paul? So what's fascinating is that they're the same person, but he has two different names. Um, Saul is the Hebrew word for his name, and Paul is the Greek word for his name. So all throughout the book of Acts, in fact, as you go through and read it, prior to his missionary journeys, he's referenced as Saul because he's in Jerusalem and other places in Judea. And so he is referenced by his Hebrew name. But when he goes out to start these churches all around the Mediterranean and and Europe and elsewhere, he's in Greek, uh, predominantly speaking country. So he's just referenced as Paul. So same same person, uh, just two different names. So if I go back and forth, that's, that's the reason why. We know him better as Paul. And he would go on to write much of the New Testament. But he has a profound story, uh, one that is just um, dripping with so much application and information for us today. So we're going to read about his story and how he came to know Jesus in a very profound way. So let's not waste any more time. Let's just dig right in. Sound good? All right, let's do it. Uh, We'll have the text up on the screens. I'll be reading from the NIV. And this is what we read. So, meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. If you remember last week, Pastor Mike talked about uh, some of the different um, conflicts that are going on in Acts chapter 8 how there is this persecution being um, unleashed, really, on the church and on the disciples, specifically with Stephen uh, being stoned. And when uh, he is killed for his faith, there is uh, an immense, obviously, persecution, but dispersion. The, The church just scatters all throughout the area. And so while that persecution is happening, Saul was still breathing out these threats against the Lord's disciples. So in Jerusalem, he went to the high priest and he asked him for letters of authority or letters of approval to go to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there in Damascus who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. A couple things to note here. So first, uh, Paul is wanting to go to Damascus because Damascus is a fairly large city that has a decent-sized Jewish population. He knows that with the church scattering, they're likely wanting to take refuge in these various cities and towns. So the first stop on his mission to eliminate followers of the way or Christians is to go to Damascus. And what's fascinating and what we're going to find here in just a moment is that this beginning part of this story is just dripping with irony because Paul's mission in this time is to travel near and far to eliminate Christianity. But yet what is going to happen in Paul's life later on is he's going to travel near and far not to stop Christianity, but to spread it and to grow it and see it flourish. But here in his BC days, he is before Christ, uh, he is still uh, wanting to eliminate Christianity. But one of the questions that can come up is if If he is a faithful Jew and a follower of God, 
why is it that he is murdering these Christians? And I think we can understand this a little bit better when we understand one of the old, famous Old Testament phrases uh, of credited to someone as righteous. In fact, that phrase is used twice in the Old Testament, at least in my research. And the first time it's used, I mean, we know this one. This is Genesis chapter 15. This is Abraham, and we know the, the promise of Abraham. And so he believes God's promise, and it is credited to him as righteousness. So when, when Abraham is believing God, it is credited as righteousness. And I'm sure this was a, a bedrock verse for Paul, as he would go on to start these various churches and also go on to write these letters, especially the letter to the Romans. I mean, this belief, this trust being the gateway into our relationship with God, that was much in his theology. But there's actually a second time that this phrase, credited as righteousness, is used. And it's very strange, as I was reading it, uh, if you want to go back and read the actual story, it's in Numbers chapter 25. It's when the Israelites, along with Moses, are traveling all throughout the wilderness, and they stop at a place near Moab. And in Moab, there are people that are intermarrying with the Israelites, and the Israelites are adopting some of the Moabite forms of worship and idolatry. And so the Lord is angry, to put it lightly, that this is even going on. And so he tells Moses and the other judges in Israel that they need to get rid of this in their camp. And while this is happening, this is, uh, go back and read it. Uh, in fact, if you are tuning out and you just want some scripture to read, read Numbers chapter 25. It is uh, PG-13. So, what happens is while this is going on and Moses is communicating this to the judges, this Israelite guy is bringing a Moabite woman into a tent to have some quality time, if you know what I mean. While this is going on, and so this guy named Phineas is incensed and he takes a spear and throws it through the guy and the girl and kills them. That's the story, number 25, go read it. So we pick up in the book of, I know, crazy, right? Psalm chapter 106, the psalmist is picking up on this. And he says in verse 30, when he's reflecting back on the story, Phineas stood up and intervened and the plague was checked. And this was credited to him as righteousness for endless generations to come. Now, I'm not going to say if what Phineas did was right or wrong. That's a completely different story. But I think you have two sides of the same coin. There is the, the belief and the trust, and then there's the action. And I think Paul was more of an action kind of guy. In fact, that's probably why he wrote in Philippians chapter 3, verse 6, as for zeal for God, I persecuted the church. And as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. He saw himself just like what they were doing back in Numbers is that if there was any sin, if there was any heresy, if there was anything that was creating impurity in the people of God, they wanted to eliminate it completely. And what this is exactly what Paul does when he's hearing about followers of the way of Jesus. So he thinks that there may be like an offsect, an offshoot of, of, the, of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so he is targeting them, eliminating them, wanting to be a faithful follower of God. Now, that sounds great in theory until he's going to realize he's going up against God himself. If we continue on in this uh, chapter 9, verse 3, we read that as Saul was nearing Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed all around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? 
And Saul asked, who are you, Lord? Now, this original word, Lord, is, it could be used in two different ways. On the one hand, we know Lord is like one of the names of God. And so he could have been saying, like, God, who are you? Like, but he doesn't know who he's speaking to. So it's most likely the other form, which is just a sign of respect. It's almost like he's saying, like, who are you, sir? He doesn't know who he's speaking to. And so the person reveals himself and he says, I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. Now there's a really important connection that we need to see that happens in this passage that we cannot miss. I mean, where is Jesus when this is taking place? He's at the right hand of the Father, right? So he's not like on earth and Saul's, you know, found Jesus and and started harassing him. No, like he's harassing the church, the followers of Jesus. But Jesus so identifies himself with the church that he connects the two. It's like when Jesus says in the gospels, whatever you do unto the least of these, you are doing unto me. And so we see this important connection made. We'll pick up on it a little bit later. But Jesus very much sees that if there is anything that is done unto the followers of Jesus, it is as if it is being done unto him. It's a very important connection that we need to make. So when Jesus says all of this, we pick up in verse 7. The men who were traveling with Saul stood, <laughs> stood there speechless. I mean, you can imagine. I mean, he just falls to the ground. And they heard the sound, but they didn't see anyone. So Saul got up from the ground, and when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. Again, the irony, irony here should be dripping. Paul was going into Damascus to lead people out by the hand back to Jerusalem. Now it's Saul who is being led by the hand into Damascus. At the very beginning of the story, Saul could see physically, but he was blind to who Jesus was. Now he can see who Jesus is, but physically he's blind. And there's so much irony that's getting picked up here on this story that really it's quite miraculous to see the change in Saul's life. So when he gets to Damascus, we read in verse 9 that for three days he was blind and he did not eat or drink anything. Now, we don't know exactly if Paul was on like a donkey or something like this, but I think this is probably where the phrase getting knocked off your high horse comes from. And I don't know if this has been true for your life and for your faith, but it's amazing how sometimes it takes moments like these where you are metaphorically knocked off your high horse for God to get your attention. I mean, sometimes we can be so blinded by our disobedience or our mission in life and what we're setting out to do that we can miss God. And sometimes God just intervenes in a really powerful way and humbles us. And praise the Lord when he does that. When he gets us off the mission we were on and puts us on the right mission. So he's, he's sitting there for three days and he doesn't eat or drink anything, and he's blind. I mean, can you imagine the situation that he's in right now? And probably the fear, the anxiety, the confusion, um, even wondering how long this is going to last. And all God, I think, does this really to grab his attention. But what's fascinating about this, and I don't know, this is just maybe more how I read scripture, but as I'm reading this, I just think to myself, why didn't Jesus just like explain himself fully at that point in time on that road to Damascus? I mean, if there was a perfect time to perfectly lay out for Saul who Jesus is and what he's all about, that would have been the right time, I think. I didn't write the Bible or have the plan, so obviously I'm I'm at fault here. But What's fascinating is we're about to get introduced to a guy named Ananias, who is a complete side character of the story. We read in verse 10, in Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias, and the Lord called to Ananias in a vision, Ananias. 
And he answered, yes, Lord. You know, you just are dying for the Lord to speak to you. And he shows up, and this is what he has to say. Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias, like Ananias can't get out of this one unless there's another person in Damascus named Ananias. But even then, he's probably maybe Saul. I don't know. I don't know how it works, but he saw a person named Ananias and he's gonna come and place hands on him and restore his sight. It's amazing because like Jesus could have just explained everything right there on that road. So why is it that (laughs) Jesus is going out of his way to involve other people? And that is because Jesus is connected to the church. So that at times, the church is the tangible presence of God to other people. And we see Ananias do this, but first without some pause. In verse 12, or verse 13, Lord, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm that he's done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And in fact, he says, He's come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on his name. I mean, imagine being someone who lived in Jerusalem at this time and then you're displaced from your home because of the persecution that is going on. And so you, you found refuge in Damascus and then all your fellow like Christians and friends start talking and say, hey, you remember Saul from Stephen's execution? Yeah, he's on his way here. Okay, like this is a well-known fact. So Ananias knows very clearly who God is sending him to. But the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument, or other translations say chosen vessel. He's going to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and to their kings and to the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. What's fascinating here is that when we read that Saul is the chosen vessel that God has uh, really planned out and predestined for um, the church and its, its growth and its expansion, as I look at that, Paul is absolutely that, that vessel that just goes all throughout the, you know, the Mediterranean and starts all these churches. But what's interesting is that God is also going to use more chosen instruments, chosen vessels for Paul. Ananias, in his own unique way, is a chosen vessel to get Saul to this place. He is that chosen instrument. And as I'm looking at this, I keep on asking, like, why would Why would God involve the other people when he seemed like he had such a great opportunity to just lay out all the cards when he was on that road? And that is because God has the chosen instrument for his mission, and that's the church. The church, we, at times, can be the tangible presence of God to people. Ananias showing up was a way to confirm the work that God was doing in Saul's life. So in verse 17, we continue on and read this. Ananias obeyed. He went to the house and he entered it and he placed his hands on Saul and he said, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. I mean, can you imagine Ananias in this moment? I mean, just picture, you have this incredible task. You are going to someone's house and the person that maybe just persecuted one of your fellows, like one of your brothers, one of your friends and Stephen, you are gonna go to him. And so I, I imagine Ananias at this point in time is, is sweating bullets. He is nervous. And as he walks into the house, he sees Saul and he's He's blind and he looks contrite and he looks humbled. He looks a lot weaker because he hasn't eaten anything for the last three days. And at that point in time, so much compassion starts to fill and you can feel the Holy Spirit moving as he places his hand on Saul and he speaks to him and prays for him. It's quite amazing to see Ananias be obedient in this way. 
after he says this in verse 18, immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. And Saul immediately got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. So Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus, and at once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, there's a really important note that as I was looking through this, I think that we need to draw out on. It's two things that Paul does immediately. The first is that he's baptized. And I think this is really important. We have baptism coming up on July 14th. And if you have never made that decision to be baptized, man, we would love to talk with you more about what that might look like for you. But baptism in the early church, that was the next step. As soon as you were ready to put your faith and trust in Christ to identify with him, you were baptized. So he does that immediately. And notice he does it before he even eats any food. Like, it may be nice, like, hey, Judas, before I leave and get baptized, can I get, like, some, some bread or something? No, he's like, this, this is how immediate and how urgent it is. Before he even gets any food, he goes and is baptized. He's like, I can eat later. I need to do this right now. So that's the first thing. Then the second thing that we see is that he goes on to the synagogue and he preaches at once or immediately that Jesus is the Son of God. So not only is he baptized immediately, but he begins to share the message of Jesus immediately. Now, I can already hear some of the, some of the pushback already. You're like, well, Adam, I've, I've done some study. Not much, but I've done some study. And I know Paul knew his Bible, and in fact, if you go back and read, he studied under, he was a Pharisee. He studied under uh, Gamaliel, who was a, a rabbi. We read about him in Acts chapter four. Um, he has a little cameo appearance. But he like knows his Hebrew Bible. He knows his scriptures. So it makes sense that he goes to the synagogues and he starts preaching the word of Jesus to them. And so I could hear you maybe saying like, I don't know my scriptures all that well. I don't know if I'm comfortable enough to just get up and start preaching a message or a sermon. And to that, I would say, sure. Okay, uh, that makes sense. But I'm convinced that we are all fluent in something. In fact, I, I've learned this because I'm not from Columbus originally, moved here six, a little over six years ago. And there's a company here called Cummins. I don't know if you've heard of it before. Um, they do engineering work, and six years in, I still could not tell you what in the world people at Cummins do. I, I'm, I'm lost on the language. It does not make any sense to me. It's a foreign language. But some of you are probably really offended right now, and you're like, I speak Cumminsese, okay? I know engineering. And if that's you, that's great, Use your language of engineering and Cummins as an opportunity to, to share and talk about Jesus with the people that share that same fluency, that same language with you. And maybe for you, it's, it's not engineering stuff. Uh, maybe it's something else. It could be anything from the line of work that you do to the relationships that you have to the similar hobbies or interests that you have in life. Any sort of topic or language is always one step away from an opportunity to talk about Jesus. Whatever conversation and whatever place that you may find yourself in, that can be the opportunity for you to share Christ with that person. Maybe for you, you come from a background uh, of substance abuse or, or maybe uh, you grew up in a, a place where you were in and out of jail or even potentially, like you have found a home and celebrate recovery here. You can use your experience and your language and your knowledge of that field to the people and the places that you may go. Maybe for you, that's not anything like you have, you know, ever experienced, and that's okay. Maybe there's something else that you are knowledgeable, knowledgeable about or passionate about or really well-versed in. Maybe for you, it's the school that you attended or currently attend. It's the job that you have or even just the things that you're passionate about. All those, and I know I'm, I'm, 
I'm drilling down on this, this section a little bit more, but I think it's important that we grasp the importance of this. Wherever you're at and whatever you're doing and whatever you're talking about, that can be the opportunity, the launching pad into a conversation about Jesus. It may not be right away. Maybe it's an opportunity to bond with the person or even to build trust. But any language, any opportunity can be that, that, that venue, that avenue for us to talk about Christ. And we see that Paul does this at once. He's baptized and he's ready to tell people about Jesus. It's a wonderful, wonderful scene. Now, in verse 21, although he's excited and passionate about doing this, not everyone else is. All those who heard them, really, they were astonished. They were shocked. They said, isn't this the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among all those who call on his name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? And they knew who he was and where he came from and what his mission was. But yet he encountered Jesus in such a stark and real way that it changed everything. So Saul grew more and more powerful. He baffled the Jews in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. And notice that he, he grew more and more powerful. When you, when you talk about Jesus, even if it's for the very first time, sometimes it is awkward or it's difficult and you're trying to find your voice and the scriptures to use or the way in which to talk about them. It's hard sometimes at first, but with the help of the Holy Spirit, the more you share the message of Jesus, the more you can grow and grow in your ability and strength to do it. So after many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. But Saul learned their plan. So when Jesus said to Ananias, hey, I'm going to show Saul how much he's going to have to suffer for my namesake, this is just the tip of the iceberg of things that are going to start coming for Paul. Um, but day and night, they kept close watch on the city gates in order, uh, they had um, not... Saul, the people who were trying to kill him, uh, kept watch on the city gates because they wanted to make sure he didn't leave town. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. I mean, can you imagine how crazy this is? Like, this is amazing. But he was so in, so committed that he was able to escape. Now, when you're cross-referencing the scriptures and trying to put kind of the timeline together, in 2 Corinthians and in Galatians 1, we have a, an idea that there's probably about a three-year time period when Saul is in Damascus. So for three years, he is learning and growing and sharing before he comes back to Jerusalem. So he's undergone a significant change but when he left Jerusalem, the people he left, they have not seen this side of Paul at all. And so when he comes to Jerusalem in verse 26, he tried to join the disciples, but they were afraid of him, not believing that he was really a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. Again, it's another one of God's chosen instruments. It's the church rising up and helping Saul as he is getting started in the faith. Barnabas, which literally means son of encouragement, grabs Saul and becomes his advocate. He told the disciples how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated, or debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they too tried to kill him. Some of the suffering started to come out already. And when the believers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Now, I was... I told this in first service, and I was like, you know what, let's, let's say it again in second service. So when I was preparing this morning, that's right, this morning, I was in my car, and I was reading through this, and I saw the word Tarsus. Now, as a Bible reader, lights should be going off, like Tarsus. I've heard that before. What's Tarsus? 
Oh yeah, that's Saul's hometown. They ship Saul back to his hometown. Now, I'm not too far removed from my youth pastoring days. So I, I, you know, with graduation happening not too long ago, I was just thinking about some conversations that I've had over the years with numbers of students. And I asked them, so, you know, tell me about where you want to go, what you want to do. And I mean, it's not always, and this isn't just a Columbus thing. This is just, I think, a teenager thing. But I've heard more often than not, I cannot wait to get out of Columbus. Have you guys heard this before? They're just like, I cannot wait to get out of Columbus. I'm ready to leave my hometown. And as I was reading this, I don't know, this is maybe facetious of me, but I was like, be careful what you wish for. Because some of you were those teenagers who were like, I cannot wait to get out of Columbus. And yet here you are. You're back in your hometown. But I think there's something really beautiful about that. Because it could be so easy to bash on like your hometown. And Saul is likely going to be in Tarsus for quite some time before he comes back to Jerusalem and starts his missionary journeys. But if like you're here in Columbus and Columbus is your hometown and, and you are here still, and you're like, what in the world am I still doing here? I mean, you have such an intricate knowledge of the people in the places of Columbus, that people like myself and, you know, other Cummins people, you know, who just came here 25 years ago and somehow they're still here 25 years later, uh, you have so much more of an insight than, than we do. And I, I believe that like sometimes God will take people to other places to do wonderful and amazing things. But don't underestimate the power of going back to the hometown and doing the Lord's work there. Because I believe if you're here and you're born and raised in Columbus, man, you can do some amazing things here in Columbus. You don't have to go far away to do amazing things for God. You can still do it right here in your hometown. So there's that. <laughs> that's, the, that's the car thought of the day. We'll see. Tarsus, Columbus, hometown. Well, let's wrap this thing up. What do you say? You guys still with me? Okay, thanks. Verse 31, and this is the last one. We'll shut it down. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace. So formerly there was a time of persecution where there was hardships going on, but now there's a time of peace. And the, the disciples were strengthened. And pay attention to this contrast here. I think it's important. Living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in number. And then it continues on, on to the next story. But that's a really, two very interesting phrases that I think it's important to catch on. Because in times of of peace, it's easy to allow our circumstances to be the place of comfort. And in times when there's persecution or hardships, where there's fear, it's easy to allow the circumstances to be the fear when we're seeking the comfort of the Holy Spirit, or maybe we're comfortable and we're seeking the fear of the Lord. But both of these two are critical in the Christian life, that we maintain a healthy fear of the Lord. I mean, just imagine Saul as a light is blinding you and you are knocked down to your knees. Friends, there's going to be one day when we have to stand before God Almighty. And I pray that you and I have a healthy sense of fear because that's scary. We do not deserve to be in that throne room. Now, luckily, because of God's grace and the blood of Christ, we have the righteousness of God accredited to us because of Jesus and his life and death and resurrection. His sacrifice atones for our sins. But let us not get mistaken. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of God. But even with that, even with that fear, that respect, that reverence, and that awe, there's a comfort or an encouragement of the Holy Spirit that exists simultaneously. There is fear of the Lord, 
and there's comfort of the Holy Spirit. I pray that we would be a people that would experience both and live in both of those things. Well, that's the, that's the conversion of Saul. It's a pretty amazing story, isn't it? And as I was thinking about as we close today, I just wanted to maybe offer two reflection questions for you. As you're going into this week, I'm sure there's maybe a number of things in this chapter that stood out to you. And if there was, I pray that you write those things down or, or write them down on your phone and, and really meditate on those. As you go to lunch, one of my favorite questions to ask is, hey, what stuck out to you from church today? And so, you know, if you want to talk about how maybe I offended you um, because of the Cummins Ease language, I'm deeply sorry. Let's get coffee and let's talk about it. But, but maybe it's that, or maybe there's just something else that the Holy Spirit literally just like illuminated in you. And you're like, wow, I never thought about that. Or that's really encouraging for me. I really want to live that out. Whatever it might be, ask each other, like write down those things that stick out to you because it can be so easy to forget. But the two questions I just want to ask you to reflect on for this week are this. First, can you reflect on who helped bring you to Christ? Who played that integral role in your life and in your formation of Jesus? Are there people that come to mind or even places? As I think about Saul, there's Ananias. There's Judas who opened up his home. There's the church in Damascus that welcomed him and accepted him and gave him a place to learn and figure things out. There's Barnabas who, when he was going to a brand new place, took him by his side and encouraged him and advocated for him. For you, can you reflect on those people in your life? Can you reflect on the places? Maybe it was a church or a small group. Maybe it was an individual. As you're thinking about those people, I'd encourage you, one, just thank God for them. Thank God for those people that spoke the word of God to you or showed you uh, what Jesus is really like. But if you have the opportunity, I know not everyone does for a variety of reasons, but if you have an opportunity, reach out to those people this week and just simply say, hey, I know it's been maybe a long time since we've talked, but I just wanted you to know like your involvement in my life it changed me. And I, I, part of the reason why I follow Jesus today is because of how you showed me Christ or whatever it may look like. I mean, you never know the role that people play in your lives. I'm sure as you're thinking about the people and places, there's maybe warm memories, some nostalgia. I know there also may be some hurt. I mean, uh, for some people who maybe played that integral role, maybe we never even knew their name. It was just a crossing of their past and we may never see them again. Uh, maybe we just don't have access to that person. We don't have their phone number or email or they're not on social media. Or maybe they've gone and passed away and they're with the Lord now forever. I just pray that as you reflect on the people that played that role, man, that you would just reflect and be filled with joy as you think about them. And if you have opportunity, uh, share with them how their involvement in your life impacted you and how it changed you. But I also want to ask you, not only who helped bring you to the Lord, you know, as we're living on mission, it's important also to ask, who is God bringing across your path? As you put on the, the heavenly glasses, the God perspective of, Lord, who are the people that you are placing in my life that I can share the message of Jesus with? Who are those people, the coworkers, the family members, the friends, the just random people that you sometimes bump up against? I believe God is bringing people across your path to share Jesus with. Now, one of the very hard things about this, I know it's really hard for me, is that we don't always see the return on our investments. You know, sometimes we spend weeks, hours investing in people and it just seems like it's not working or the, you spend so much time praying for this one person and you are still praying right now for them. It's hard because we don't always see the return on our investments. We don't always see, you know, the fruits of our labor. 
But that's completely okay because I'm sure there were people that prayed for Saul who never saw Saul moving on and accepting Christ. I mean, think of Stephen. Stephen prayed, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. I bet he would have loved to have seen Saul come to know Christ, but that's not how his story went. And so for the people that you are investing in, do not lose heart. Because I guarantee you, there's going to come a day, not on this side of heaven, because on this side of heaven, we're not going to see all the return on our investments. We're not going to see all the fruit of our labor. But there's going to become a time when everything will be laid bare and exposed, and we will see the fruits of our labor. There's going to be people in heaven that you go, are you kidding me? I had no idea. That's incredible, like amazing. You have no idea the impact that you have because we do not do this for a return on our investment. We don't do this for the results. We do this out of obedience because Jesus has so radically changed our lives that we want to share it with anyone and everyone who's willing to listen. And even for those who are not willing to listen, we want to live our lives as a witness, as a billboard sign that God is real and he's changed our lives through Jesus Christ. Now, as we close today, I'm gonna invite you to stand with me and I wanna close with a word of prayer and um, offer you a blessing. So if you would, let's stand together and let's pray. God, thank you so much for your word and for the time that we have to gather in worship. God, I thank you for the witness that we have in Saul's life. I pray, Lord, that we would take this whole account to heart. And for the different things that we need, God, I know for me, I cannot speak to every person here, but your Holy Spirit can. So I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to each and every one of our hearts that you would challenge us in the areas that we need challenged, that you would encourage us in the areas that we need encouraged. And God, I pray that as we reflect this week on the people that have played a role into our lives and showing us who Jesus is, I pray that you would just fill our hearts with thanksgiving. And as we search and analyze who it is that maybe we can share the faith with, I pray that you would make those people and those places clear in our lives, that you would give us opportunity to share our faith. And God, we know that um, our words can only do so much. So would you fill us with your Holy Spirit and with power? And may you get all the glory forever and ever. Amen. As you are sent out today, I want to send you out with this blessing. It comes from Acts chapter 9, verse 31. As you are sent out today, may you go in the encouragement of the Holy Spirit and in the fear of the Lord. You are sent out.